So, today's interview, um, I'm at Edina with uh, Nicola Osborne, who's agreed to tell us about her work in the field of citizen science and crowdsourcing. Okay. Um, so, yes, like I said, I'm Nicola Osborne. I'm based in Edina. So, Edina run lots of online services for further higher education, mm -hmm. but also lots of research projects as well. So, at the moment, I'm a digital education manager and managing a multimedia service. But I have been working on a project called Cobweb, which is a huge uh, four-year project with 13 different partners involved across Europe looking at how we can use citizens to be part of the kind of data collection and engagement process in environmental science. So that's my kind of, my main focus of citizen science life activity has been on that. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about that, uh, how that project was kind of developed and what it focused on? So it brings together kind of expertise from both kind of technical and environmental fields as well. So the project itself is building this sort of um, generic set of tools to be used in crowdsourcing. So from mobile phones that are very kind of simple and user-friendly and designed for being out in a flood or being out in the environment, um, through to kind of quality checking stages, um, authentication stages, and into a kind of web portal as well. So the idea is that there'd be a lot of different projects all enabled with the same set of tools. Um, and to make that actually get built, you can need some examples. So there are also a whole series of co-design projects. Um, so the project has partners from five different countries, but projects in three different locations. So in UNESCO biospheres in Wales, Germany and Greece. And they're currently doing co-design projects uh, in those three locations. Yep. So a whole bunch of interesting uh, additional challenges. So in addition to all the things you would normally get with um, citizen science projects, so like verification of data, um, managing data from lots of different people and how they kind of choose to tag and mark it up and all those kind of things. Um, but there's also some language elements. Uh, there's the issue of how we structure things so that it works for different types of projects, uh, but without having to design a completely new tool every time. So it's been a really interesting project for raising all kinds of issues, sort of social issues and cultural issues, um, as well as technical ones as well. And was this project necessary because the, a lot of these elements weren't there? <coughs> um, generally speaking, when there are citizen science projects kicked off, they tend to be very much, here is an app built for this one project, or here is a tool built for this one project. And so there was, it felt like there was definitely a gap there for something that was more generic that could be reused. Um, some of the kind of key elements that are different about our project is that it's designed to fit into um, some existing standards around geographical data. Um, so uh, the data that is produced through this process is Inspire compliant and inspires the um, directive within the EU for environmental data of some very specific types to be made publicly available. So there's a kind of publication format for that. Um, and for the same reason it links into GEOS, which is um, a sort of portal that lets you access Inspire compliant data. So there's some kind of very specific kind of gaps it was filling from that point of view. From sort of an obligation for um, governments in different locations to make that. So they can go almost go straight to open data. Yes, pretty much. Although again, one of the kind of levels of complexity is making sure that we're not releasing anything that it's not appropriate to release. Really. So in addition to kind of quality, that's also about if someone is collecting endangered species data, that's not going to be published. So uh, part of the project is also about scoping which kinds of data one shares and which kind of data one can't share. And the Inspire directive is also fairly sensible about that. <laughs> they don't expect you to share things that are not appropriate to share. Um, so the gaps it was filling, I guess, were both for not requiring every single project that wants to start up to need to set up their own tools and build their own tools, but also from a very kind of specific um, government point of view and sort of public policy kind of point of view, having tools that fit the expected not really file formats, but kind of method by which those, that data is supposed to be shared. So the Welsh Government is actually a, one of the 13 partners in the project um, who have been helping keep us on track in the kind yeah. of uh, governmental requirements kind of point of view. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So how long before that's going to be, there's going to be something coming out of this? The yeah. Co-Design projects have functioning prototypes at the moment. Mm -hmm. So there is a version that you can go out and use. I think I have a version on my phone actually. So I was, I was with the project until February and in February I switched job hats. So my mm -hmm. colleagues are currently working on it. Um, I believe the pilots and the co-design stuff is going on at the moment. So it's being tested in the field. The mobile apps in particular, but actually other elements of the interfaces have been developed with people in the communities we want to take part so that they work for them. 
and because of that it's a slightly longer process so um, those pilots are really helping us highlight what it is their needs are, if the forms make sense, if the data makes sense, if the yeah. process makes sense. So by communities you mean the professionals working? Or it's sort of community groups and organisations who are organising little small scale crowdsourcing projects mm -hmm. in the locations within those biospheres. So um, the Curzon projects I know best are the ones in Wales, uh, but there are a series in Greece as well. Um, and the ones down there are organised by people like the RSPB, mm -hmm. um, by uh, Cardigan Bay Marine Wildlife Group, I think, used to focus on megafauna, uh, Snowdonia National Park, uh, the local secondary school is involved. Mm -hmm. So they're quite different types of communities. There are some volunteer kind of neighbourhood communities, but also, you know, the RSPB, yeah. Angwood Bank, people like that, very much more structured organisations. They have very different needs. Um, that's one of the more interesting things about testing it with a genuinely diverse community yes. of users. Um, you know, the, the people who are using it might be used to submitting environmental data in some kind of format, and they might be completely new to it. Um, and actually, the idea of the thing that we're building um, has been to make it flexible enough to gather both types of data, so stuff that is much easier for a novice user to go through, but also mm -hmm. accommodating of non-novice users, you know, so relatively expert. Uh, volunteers or, or paid people, it might yeah. well be paid people using the same tool. Yeah. So is it focused around data collection or is there another layer to it? Uh, there's data collection, there's quality assurance, there's a whole um, whole work package looking at quality assurance mm. and a whole work package looking at um, for, uh, authentication. So the idea being that if you want to make sure that only a restricted set of people can take part in an experiment, um, then there is a way of authenticating those people and a way of doing that in a quite sort of seamless, sensible yeah. way. So we use um, Shibboleth, which is the same thing that uh, is used in the UK Access Management Federation. So if you ever logged into a sort of online resource, that's often what you're logging in yeah. with. Um, so it's very secure, but it also allows you to be quite quite clever about who you share data with. And that's mm -hmm. particularly with things like endangered species and sort of okay. data that you'd want to limit access in mind, but also things like, you know, if you had government wardens, for instance, kind of gathering data and wanting to use it for very specific purposes and they didn't want to publish it, that might be a, a route to doing that. That's the idea that you can restrict data collection and data access to a set of people. So um, the quality assurance side of it has been also quite an interesting, complicated mm -hmm. thing because different organisations require quality assurance in a completely different set of ways. So yes. um, there's a community forum that are doing work around their housing. They're probably not going to be as bothered about um, the level of quality assurance because they can probably go and check with somebody mm. what it was they saw, you know, they're quite nearby what's going on. Um, you know, the RSPB, Snowdonia National Park, bigger organisations, bigger audiences, they might want to have a certain amount of quality assurance um, to make sure that they understand what they've had in from lots of different yes. people that they maybe haven't had direct contact with. Welsh Government's going to want a whole different level of quality assurance to make sure they can actually use that data in a meaningful way, especially if it's going alongside Earth observation data or Mm. Uh, sensor data, stuff that they know is reliable. As soon as you start combining less reliable data with reliable data, you can get into some interesting challenges. So you have to know, not necessarily that it's perfect, but you have to know what level of incorrect it is, or what level of reliable it is, so yes. that you can um, you can judge it according yeah. to weight. So according what, quality is one of the key issues we're looking throughout these courses. Um, what sort of mechanisms are that? Also, crowdsource quality control, or is it all done? Is it is it some statistical methods, or is it by experts? Um, I mean, there are lots of different approaches you can take, mm -hmm. and I know that there are places uh, that will do it just based on number of identical submissions. Now, that's so that's something that's university, so they show a lot of people the same images, mm -hmm. and they will look through and see which ones match up. That works very well if you're controlling what data people see or what data they're gathering. Um, for our project, the likelihood is that your group of people will not all be seeing the same thing at the same mm -hmm. moment. So it's much more about things like, um, are they located in the place they say they are? And what data can we gather from the phone when they've got the app on it mm -hmm. to verify that? Um, what can we do in terms of their consistency of previous submissions to sort of see if their current one is likely to be correct? Is there some way of you know, assigning some people in the system a more trusted status than others? Um, there's a whole set of different options and certainly the way in which it's being done properly brings it together a whole set of those so that you don't just have one level of course but yeah. you can select which ones you use. Mm. 
So um, if you're, you're needing a very high spec or very quality assured set of data, you can do that if you're doing it as a public engagement thing and you're not that bothered by the data you get out of it. It's all about getting people involved and trying out the scientific method. You can choose how much light to weigh one that just sort of says, you know, take out the totally inappropriate photos. <laughs> <laughs> but I know, I know, to be absolutely fair, the, the last point test of historical assurance process in, uh, in play, which was some months ago, um, it's a really nice set of different options that you could use, and some of those are about sort of data um, mm. methods, so sort of seeing if it looks like it's likely to be correct in some statistical ways, and some of those were about very specific sort of location checking and liability checking. Yeah. Um, it, it's the combination of those, I think, yeah. which will Do make it... Do you have any learning mechanisms built in to help people improve the quality of data that's being put in? I think at present that would be very much about how stuff is presented within sort of apps and interfaces and information for a particular experiment. Mm. Um, and there's certainly some guidance notes within the stuff apps. I know the sort of prototype apps had some guidance about stuff, you know, for instance, with flooding, how to do things safely, but also what it is they're looking for. Yeah. So there's an element of that. Um, but I think there's probably scope to do potentially more with that. I don't know if that's something that um, is like, uh, given that we're about two and a bit years into a four-year project, um, I'm not sure what we'll end up with at the end in terms of that kind yeah. of stuff. But it would be nice to think that our citizens get more qualified the more they participate, and that's... Certainly what you see from other crowdsourcing and yeah. citizen science projects, you see participants getting really, really expert in some cases, you know, getting really involved. Um, so I think, I think there'll be an element of that in, in the actual tools that they're using, but I think it's more likely to also be around the, the person who's running that project, so the organisation or the individual who's running a smaller project using those tools. Interesting. Um, you've been working around with people who've been doing this in different areas yeah. uh, for the last few years. What, what's the state of this sort of citizen science crowdsourcing within science? It's, it's quite interesting because it's, sort of, it's not a new concept in some way. So there's a really nice report um, done for the UK um, Earth Observation Framework, I think it is. Um, that looked across crowdsourcing projects that have been going on for a while. And obviously things like the Great British Garden Bird mm. Watch, I guess that cleans title, but the RSPB is running effectively a citizen science project for sort of 40, 50 years, um, but it wasn't labelled in that way. Mm. So there's quite a long tradition, especially in environmental science, for doing some kind of participatory uh, experiment. And really, if you do kind of history of science, you know, science yeah, is always, yeah, it's there's, there's always kind of a participatory thing. But in terms of the kind of more sophisticated sort of web enabled and app enabled stuff, um, I think you've got some maturity from certain kinds of uh, disciplines and areas. So environmentally there's loads of different projects and there's starting to be a kind of sense of techniques that work well and approaches that work well, um, which is why you've got stuff like this, you know, these reports that give a good overview of what's taking yeah. place. Um, in astronomy, you know, Universe or the player in town, yeah. um, they're doing a job. In biology, you get things like Foldit for that sort of um, identifying proteins. So there are a few kind of groupings where there's lots of things taking place, um, and there's a sort of growing understanding of how you might use this for data collection. And it's often, I think it's it, at the moment the kind of main application that's been around dealing with data at scale. Um, there are smaller projects that tend to be about science communication, and there are bigger projects that tend to be about data at scale. And I'd say the kind of image recognition type stuff, the kind of um, universe stuff, the sort of cancer cell stuff, mm -hmm. that stuff's quite mature. There's an easy, pro you know, straightforward process to do that. There's a quality assurance process for doing that. I'd say the kind of stuff that Cobweb has been working on, the kind of environmental science, but where it's much more about monitoring in a sort of broader sort of sense. I think that's still maturing. It's not quite there yet because it's, there are so many different types of factors that can come in. There tend to be lots of different things taking place and knowledge being shared. There's a lot of stuff going on to share that knowledge at the moment. Yeah. But it's not quite in that place where there's a sort of one clear approach. There's lots of interesting approaches. Um, and it, you get sort of other little outlier things taking place. So you have some of the kind of... Um, there's some innovation kind of spaces where you can sort of crowdsource ideas, but there's still more commercial ideas, and there's there's a couple of different sort of models there. So I think it's 
semi-mature, I would guess. Yes. Um, there are sort of much, the models are quite diverse, I think that's interesting because in some of the other places where crowdsourcing is used, there may be sort of more straightforward approaches being sort of taken, so um, a lot of digitised texts and books and things being sort of effectively typed back in by people, yeah. you know, that's quite a kind of classic citizen science, well, it's a crowdsourcing project yeah. in the kind of humanities, and that has a certain shape to it, and that sits in a different sort of place, I think. Um, so I think it's, it's becoming quite a useful tool, but I mean, one of the interesting things from the point of view of the stuff that we've been working on is that it's expensive to put sensors in every place you want to put it in a rural area where you only have a legal obligation as a local government or as a, um, a conservation organisation to cover a small mm. set of requirements, you know, either a small number of measurements or a small area or yeah. whatever. And so there are real opportunities for using crowdsourcing to kind of cover those gaps. But what's interesting about a rural location, and the projects we've involved with have been quite rural, is that there also aren't many people. So the idea of a crowd is an interesting challenge mm -hmm. there. So <laughs> you start to see why there have been a lot of like image recognition projects and a lot of things at scale more than sort of boots on the ground kind of projects in, in super rural locations. So OpenStreetMap is an interesting one, OpenStreetMap being sort of, so I'd say yes, in this uh, geographical stuff. Um, they have brilliant, brilliant coverage in OpenStreetMap volunteered for urban areas, and they have brilliant coverage in some other locations, but you get to kind of rural areas and it gets to be less strong. So there's this kind of odd dynamic where some yes. of the gaps in the information are also the gaps in where the people are and trying to work out how to... Um, I think you need super keen people anyway for crowdsourcing projects, but the kind of you know, your kind of break-even point of effort versus kind of reward is, is yes. in so a much more interesting place. It gets certain distance, but it doesn't fill in the, the, you know, you can fill in quite a lot of yeah. holes, but not all of them. A couple of things that I want to pick up, pick up on there. One is, you mentioned this is being used by uh, local authorities and organisations that are obliged to collect certain data. Mm -hmm. um, can you give me a couple of examples? Um, okay, so in the case of the areas that Corbett's operating in, um, the Welsh Government needs to look at things like flooding data and mm. likelihood of flooding in an area. And they have sensors in some locations and they're obliged to kind of record those and report those. But putting them in all the areas you would possibly want them to be in is just cost prohibitive. You couldn't possibly do it and you couldn't justify putting in expensive sensors in sort of 12 locations because two houses might be affected. The, two people, the people who live in those two houses, they're more than happy to collect the data because it really, really matters to them. So that would be kind of part of the example. Um, I guess the other kind of, op sort of related area to that would be things like local authorities um, engaged in crowdsourcing projects where they haven't necessarily initiated them, the sort of um, fix my street type stuff, yeah. the sort of where sort of citizens are. I, I think at first they were just sort of tapping them on the shoulder and saying you need to do what you're expected to, you know. Um, I think at this point it's sort of the citizens are far better at mapping out where the need is anyway. Yeah. So I, I know that Edinburgh Council's recently done a sort of crowdsourced, how should we how should we spend less money yes. kind of budget tool. And I think that's quite an interesting development. I think that sort of direct democracy kind of idea coming appearing around the same sort of time as social media and crowdsourcing, mm -hmm. it, it does mean you get a lot of kind of crossover of some of those ideas. Um, but it, yeah, in terms of the obligations it's about sort of reporting on sort of numbers of particular species as well. That's yeah. something that there's an obligation to do sort of monitoring what's happening in your area and actually going back and check every year and each of those things cost money and each of yeah. those things um, require to have a lot of people around yeah. or to sample only a small area if you don't, not able to do lots of people and that is most places where having a, even a few more volunteers can make quite a big difference yeah. to how much data you can capture. Yeah. And, and the second thing is, is, is the people who are the volunteers, what have you learned about why they do it? It's a good question. <laughs> I think we've been motivated by really different things. So, although I've been involved in this project for about two and a half years, I've been sort of interested and engaged with crowdsourcing in some form or another for, for a while before that. And what you find is motivations can, can be hugely wide ranging. So, some people do it because they're looking for something to fill a bit of time that is very different from what they're doing in their day job. So, that's like your classic Zooniverse participant, your classic. Um, uh, 
sort of transcriber of texts, you know, those kind of participants, they're often people who want to do that. I think for the environmental projects, the stuff that Cole's been working on, it's often about an interest in the environment and an interest in what the sort of meaning behind that data is. Um, and that's quite interesting because a lot of those crowdsourcing projects, you're doing a thing that's quite mechanical, like Foldit Proteins is like a video game almost, mm -hmm. you know, you click on things and you don't necessarily understand the science behind it and, and you could, but it'd be quite an effort to work out what's going on on the screen. Um, whereas for kind of environmental data, even capturing one data point tells you something, you know. Um, so I think quite a lot of people involved in those projects, it is about sort of environmental issues, environmental concerns, um, usually in a kind of conservation type direction, but sometimes uh, from a point of view of, you know, things like planning and development, things like flooding mm. uh, and insurance. Um, but there has to be some kind of motivating factor, otherwise they're just, you know, not going to stick with it. And there needs to be some kind of reward back again as well. Um, in addition to my role here, I do some teaching on a science communication MSE. Mm. And one of the things that it's quite sort of quite important, but sometimes easy to forget, is that people do need to be rewarded for doing something. They're not going to come back and do it lots of times. So you have this kind of participation pattern in, in crowdsourcing projects where you have several super keen users or a large quantity of super keen users, but it's a small percentage usually of your, your group of participants. And I think depending on the project, but the, the kind of the magic bit to get right is how to motivate enough people to be in that group that you get enough of the data that you need to cover enough of the areas that you need. Um, so there you know, are lots of different ways to do that, but I think often that's about communicating back the results of what's happened, especially in environmental projects. Mm -hmm. um, so the RSPBs one, for instance, they report every year on which garden birds have been spotted less or spotted more, and that's then a really interesting story to people who are interested in birds and will motivate them to go back and collect them again the next year. That's a nice example of a very cheap way of rewarding people for their participation. You know, Zooniverse gives co-credits on papers. Um, for Cobweb, the projects are kind of pretty hyper-local, so I think the kind of motivation for our participants there is very much about either finding a more interesting way to do stuff they're going to do anyway. Um, so in one case, you know, the, the megafauna project, they do it on paper currently, paper and and or into, into the databases elsewhere. Um, so putting it all together in one place and doing it in a more straightforward way that's going to save them some time. So there's a motivation for people taking part there because they're going to do it anyway and it saves some time and they're really interested. Um, but for the sort of, I don't know, your school groups and things, you know, the motivation is it's got to be a bit fun as well as being interesting and telling them something about the local environment. Yeah. So it, it varies hugely mm -hmm. and depending on how you set that experience up, what's going to actually work in terms of motivations will vary as well because there are some projects that I think how much science you understand in it isn't, isn't relevant at all. And there are some projects where it's much more relevant than the data that they collect. Yeah. And that, that's all just to do with choices on the part of the person who set up that project to work out what it is they want to get out of it, what the goals are, and what a sort of success in that project will look like. Yeah. Um, have you seen any paid crowdsourcing in science? I think most examples I've seen have been in sort of, um, they've been in that sort of transcribe yeah. translation, um, Political manifesto, someone do a kind of live <laughs> political yeah. manifesto coding. Um, I'm not aware of them, that doesn't mean that's not going on, but but there are some crowdsourcing type tools that are used by a mixture of professionals and volunteers. Mm -hmm. So there are paid people yes. engaged, I mean, not just people who are setting out the yeah. project perhaps, but sort of, um, we have a little app called Field Trip GB. And we know that's being used in a couple of forests, and the people who are using that are a mixture of the paid staff that work in those forests and the unpaid volunteers that are yeah. committed to those areas and visitors. So there are there is that kind of yeah. mixture in that but sense. It's not really specifically people just being it's paid. Not people kind of going. To see a bird or yeah, exactly. And I think um, that's probably not entirely unrelated to the fact that the kind of data being collected there. Um, that, that might skew the results yeah. to some extent. Whereas the transcription stuff, you're not going to necessarily be concerned. You, know, you, can, you can rate the quality and if it's poor, you can yeah. choose to not pay them and that's kind of how those usually work. Um, but for, for something where you, you're not going to be there, you can't double check it, you can't verify it in any other way. I think there's a sort of, the trust in that data probably, mm -hmm. probably partly comes from the fact that they're unpaid, but there's a whole tension there because some of this work is stuff that maybe you would have paid a whole series of people to do previously. And I know that there is a kind of concern about exploitation of volunteers, potentially. 
um, particularly because you do have the kind of superpower volunteers. So I saw a project once explaining how half of their data had been entered by one person. Yeah. And you sort of thought, you know, you should just be paying that one person. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that does seem slightly exploitative. Now, she was enjoying doing it, the one person, because they'd spoken to her. Yeah. Uh, and I know that they, in that case, rewarded the participants by having them come in and have a sort of exclusive viewing of some of their collections and uh, meeting them and sort of it, making a very tangible reward back to them to try and make sure they realised that they were valued. But it, it is a tension because um, a lot of these environmental projects, they're covering information that is still needed, but maybe would previously have been done through sort of funded people mm -hmm. out on the ground. It's, it's a tricky thing. So, um, thinking a bit more kind of practically, you, you talked about the, the tools that, and, and the supports that have been developed in, in Cobweb. If an organisation says, well, we would like to do some sort of like, data collection, crowd data collection, how would they go about it? Are there tools there? Are there, are there like, in this information there to help them have to set, how to set it up? What's, what, is, is it something you can go and do uh, starting from, from not having any experience? I think you can. Um, there's lots of resources available. I think probably before that point, asking lots of kind of questions about why you're doing it will be quite important to make sure that is the right approach to take. And then in terms of how you go about thinking about what tool you're going to use, for instance, it's probably going to involve quite a lot of piloting stuff and trying stuff out. So I mentioned Field Trip, that's a, that's a free app, you can try stuff out with that, even if you then want to go and do it with something else in reality. Um, Cobra will be available, that'll be about a couple of years down the line, I think, it's another year probably until there's anything to go and play with. Um, but actually things like wikis can be quite useful for getting just an initial kind of go at gathering some data together, you know, sort of identifying your audience. Um, I, th I think the tricky bit is you need to find, work out what it is you actually want to collect, what kind of format it's going to be in, if there's a tool that already does that, and if you go and have a look through things like the, um, the report I mentioned, um, if you go and have a look at sort of other sites and other citizen science projects and see what they're using. Um, so, you know, I've mentioned Zoomverse a few times, they have like 18 or 19 projects, I think, now. They're using effectively the same tool, but they're using it in different ways. Um, so there are kind of people that you can go and approach as well. So, you can, you know, you can approach them, you can approach um, UCLs, the whole bunch of crowdsourcing projects, you can approach people like us. So I'd say the first step is to go and speak to those other people anyway, because there's about to be some kind of feedback on mm -hmm. what's realistic, what's not realistic. Um, but I think the bit that's probably at least as important as any of the technology is working out who the hell your audience is. Do they actually want to take part? Mm. Are they tech savvy? Are they using a particular tool already? You know, there are crowdsourcing projects that just use Flickr pictures and a particular tag or a particular yeah. group. That can work as long as you know your audience are going to also be on Flickr. There are Twitter projects the same. Mm. Uh, the UK Sound Map was an example of that where the British Library picked up lots of different sound recordings using the same hashtag. That yeah. works as long as you know you've got an audience yeah. there. So I think getting to know your audience and how big it's going to be and how many you need to be actively contributing it to some extent before you actually have a useful set of data. I think getting a handle on that will then lead you to the right kind of set of tools. Mm. I think that's probably the right way around to kind of think about it. To sort of, you can't go and ask someone what kind of tool do you want to no. use, but you can go and ask them what they're already using or what they're already familiar with. Um, so our project has an interesting challenge. Our project is in rural areas where there is not very good internet reception. Mm. Um, not on phones and not regular internet connections in homes. So one of the requirements of Cobweb is that it works offline. That's quite an important requirement. That's also quite different from quite a lot of tools. Um, if you know that your participants are all not online at all, then you know crowdsourcing might have to be in a very different format, <laughs> and it might still be fine to do it that way. So I think just kind of getting a handle on what's going to make sense to that audience, where you can you can bring them along with you a bit, yeah. but what it's going to take to move them along to a place where they can actually contribute. And feel motivated to contribute more than once because the more the more the more contributions they make, the kind of better return you're getting on any kind of publicity you're doing, any support you're doing, any um, sort of local work or mm. workshops, whatever you're doing. So I think if you can get a handle on that, then you go and speak to other people who've been running these projects already, or have a look at the tools that are available already. Um, sometimes the low tech approach works quite well. <laughs> um, yeah, there's, there's, in terms of the other people who run kind of crowdsourcing projects, there's also um, a team down in Bristol actually did the computer science that again have got some experience in doing stuff in environmental science, batch tracking, things like that. 
Um, so there's not a shortage of people running these kinds of projects. But I think before you get to the point of saying, how do I tech this up, you have to kind of step back and go, is this actually mm, going to be yeah. a cheaper, more effective way? Or is, you know, is my main goal to communicate what it is we're doing? Or to get people used to trying something out? So a lot of the, um, the open projects have been about getting school kids to understand scientific methods. The data they collect is not the yeah. higher priority, you know. So what, what is the higher priority there? And, and then where's your audience? Where are they going to hang out? Mm. Are they going to participate? Do you have a group of them that you can kind of bring with you from the outset to help you design the tools? Um, I think that's certainly been helpful for us to have a group of people from not quite the outset, but still early on to the project, telling us that's not going to work. You know, that is going to work. This kind of device isn't going to work because that's the other thing you can. Once you get into the kind of building stage, you have to go. Well, okay, which is this Android or is this iOS mm, yeah. or is this something else? You know, there's a whole bunch of other kind of technical questions. So the more you can get those kind of fundamental is this worth doing, who's going to participate, once you know that and you've got some feedback from them, then you can actually go in a lot better enabled with, with information to make those choices. Yeah. Okay. Um, are there, have you found kind of unexpected advantages or drawbacks and difficulties? You didn't really, you know, in, in any particular cases or ones you've done or ones you've seen? Um, I'd say the advantages from, from our project and from other ones as well is that sense of building up a network of enthusiasts. That's infectious. Mm -hmm. So when you start working on a project and lots of other people around you are super enthused about it, that's, that's brilliant. Like, it's you really motivated as well as them and that's, that's lovely. Um, I think there are also some quite unexpected things sometimes that you find some quirky little things. Um, so that's, that's fantastic. On a kind of very practical basis, the scale can be a huge advantage. Um, if you can get enough people participating and it's that if that's the kind of big disadvantage it's usually risky so in terms of how much money you might sink into a crowdsourcing project the risk of people not participating is your main issue you know I think people worry a lot about is the data going to be good enough quality will I get penis pictures you know what will I get that's not okay and actually the big, big issue is probably going to be what happens when you get three responses so I've been involved in a sort of small scale crowdsourcing project before now which you know that did not get hundreds and hundreds of responses. We didn't engage the community at the right stage. And um, in terms of where the release of what we wanted to make available happened versus when the funding ran out, um, it wasn't balanced in the right way. Um, that's good, we've learned from that. Um, and that was a very small scale thing in terms of yeah, the project itself. But um, I think that is also a sort of interesting criteria, that sort of thing of you need to get whatever you're doing out the door early enough that you've got the time to support and refine and yeah. learn from the data and maybe support, fix some things and engage the community more if there's a risk of them not participating enough. So I think, you know, <coughs> finding that audience, communicating that audience the whole way through helps deal yeah. with that risk, but it's still a risk. Um, and that's part of the reason I think you've got a couple of organisations that have a very big presence in crowdsourcing and citizen science, you know. Wikipedia is the big crowdsourcing yeah. one, you know, but there's lots, lots of quite big names that comes back because once they get a bit of press coverage and a bit of traction, then they have a big group of users. And if those people are able to take part in other projects, mm -hmm. then they can email them all out. You know, they never mm -hmm. underestimate the value of a very boring email list. Um, so you kind of build up a community, and that means you have more potential participants, mm -hmm. and that means you're more capable of getting press coverage and interest and that sort of thing. Um, that that makes the biggest difference, I think, in terms of the kind of the disadvantages. It's, it's much more about risk of not participating than anything else. Yeah. But there is also the risk of, is this data usable? People get quite precious about crowdsource data and quite um, snobby about their researcher data and which they think is trustworthy. So I think thinking about the quality that you need at the outset and making sure that the process you've put in place is um, appropriate to what you need, that, that's also quite important for dealing with that risk. Yeah. Um, you don't want to spend a lot of money, get lots of people enthused and get lots of data gathered and feel like you can't rely on that data for anything useful because that then hasn't saved anything. You know, <laughs> If you're going out and verifying everything by hand, that probably isn't a good mm -hmm. sign either. Um, even some reasonably big projects have had kind of manual verification of images and stuff in some cases and you sort of think, that's not very sustainable. You know? <laughs> so the ones that have done really well tend to be the ones where they can, mm -hmm. um, they can, they can handle that scale and they can also attract people to take part in it rather than um, yeah, having to rely on sort of very, yeah. very manual checking to make sure the data is absolutely of the quality they want. Maybe sampling it, but not, mm. not checking every data point. So something that's come up is, is to come a balance between public engagement and actually doing real science. Yeah. Um, 
is that something that is is well understood? Uh, I mean, do you think? Uh, and do you think when you look at the totality of the citizen science participatory programs, are they more about good science, or are they actually more about public engagement and and uh, maybe some sort of political lobbying agenda or something like that? Oh, there's some of all of it. <laughs> it depends on the project. So yeah. some of them. Um, the astronomy ones, they're pretty good science, that's pretty solid, but that's a community that already, like environmental science, the amateur community is already quite engaged and quite well qualified and does a lot of stuff already with the research community. Um, I don't think I've seen anything that's sort of quite so collaborative looking in, say, a kind of, you know, you're going to get a pharmacology project of that ilk because that's, that's a different kind of dynamic in that field. Um, there's a bit of politics to it, definitely. It's definitely good to be seen to be engaging with your uh, your citizens or your participants or whatever. Quite a lot of them are. Um, science communication, I think that's no bad thing. Um, because doing is often a nice, much more effective and nicer way of learning than just of listening to somebody tell you what it is to be a scientist of this ilk or what it is to witness something. Um, I think how good quality the data is and sort of good science being behind particular projects, I think that is increasingly the case for kind of large scale projects. So COPOB's funded by the European Union, they have a whole suite of citizens observatory projects of which we're one. They have another round of funding coming up, so mm -hmm. same thing again. Um, I think for that work to be justifiable at that scale and at that cost, there has to be good science behind it, but there has to also be public engagement and there has to also be kind of, kind of political value to doing that. Mm -hmm. So citizen empowerment is a really important part of those projects. Um, but you get crowdsourcing projects that are, you know, three people doing a tool for fun. And those are definitely, you know, that's, that's not about any of those things. That's purely yeah. about sort of being very pragmatic and showing the data you need at that, that moment. So I think, I'm not sure that there is a kind of necessarily trend. I think the large scale ones, there has to be a degree of good science in there. Um, but I also think, you know, the public engagement side of it is, is common across a lot of the more successful projects. Um, because that's that's really motivating. If you learn something that is motivating, you know the rise of MOOCs and uh, yeah. sort of open learning in general. I think sort of fits into that same category. People people want to find out something new. They want to learn something. Um, so keeping people motivated in that way is much more effective than you know paying them by the word or something. You know, um, yeah, yeah. So I'm not sure there's a trend, but you, you see all of those factors coming in in different ways. And I think it depends what an organisation needs. Yeah. Really, there's some lovely. Um, there's some lovely small scale kind of crowdsourcing citizen engagement kind of mm. projects that are much more about public engagement and much more about real buy in from a community. And I think those are still really, really valuable. Um, but the data is maybe not the value yeah. of it. The data about how they respond to that or what they've learned and the evaluation of that, that may be very useful. But the data they produce from what they're contributing yes. isn't always going to be the most It's a multi layered process. Yeah. Um, of, Thinking about the date, thinking about the place you are, and trying to change what you do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for our projects, I think the, the data itself is pretty important, and that's where there's a lot of quality assurance and authentication stuff going on. But having said that, our code design projects include a few that I think the learning is at least as important as any data it produces. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I think one of the the nice advantages in general is that kind of cross collaboration between groups who don't always talk to each other. So. For us, it's sort of, you know, the school is working with the RSPB and the RSPB is getting to hang out with some Welsh government people and with some people from Edinburgh yeah. they never would have hung out with otherwise and and that's lovely. And some of those people know each other and some of them don't and that's that's kind of a nice perk regardless of whatever is produced in those individual projects and whether it's useful to each other. Um, and you see that a lot with kind of serendipitous connections happening. Yes, that's so interesting because once you, I mean, you're, you're opening up this process and you never know who is actually going to be joining in yeah. the process. And you never know who's got an interest, especially in sciences, you don't understand that don't know without asking who's interested in sciences. Because a lot of people will do like I did, science courses up to A level. Mm -hmm. Um and then they may go on to university and do them and may not, but they certainly may not work in them as their day job. But their interest might yeah. still be sitting there kind of lurking. And I think there can be a perception that the public aren't necessarily interested in all kinds of areas of science, you know. Uh, medicine maybe, but you know not everything else. And actually, once you start kind of putting a project out there, you start getting this really lovely kind of um, 
yeah, serendipitous connections yeah. with other communities and people who have a shared interest. Um, I know for the Zoomverse community is very, very mature. They have a lot of um, people who have gone from being participants to being kind of meet, uh, moderators on their boards yeah. to being sort of cheerleaders for the project to having their own separate communities that meet up. You know, Wikipedia has kind of hackathons and meetups around the place, and you, there's a lot of kind of new and interesting stuff that gets generated there and sometimes sort of spin out crowdsourcing projects yeah. that happen when that happens. Um, so as long as you get kind of big, long-lasting community, you can get all kinds of weird, interesting <laughs> kind of side things come off it as well. Um, but that actually, that, that is one of the things I know um, in terms of some of the, the questions that when you're planning this kind of project, I think when you think about the risk of people not participating, there's also a risk that they all kind of go wild for it, but you've only got funding for three years or something. I think that's an interesting, when you're starting out a project, working out what the kind of exit strategy is, can you hand it back to the community or can you, uh, yes. where are you going to find your volunteer funding from? Because I don't think it's necessarily given that if you've got a big active community, you'll automatically continue to get funding for it, you know. Um, so I think that's also a kind of an odd little thing one needs to plan for yes, things. So um, finally, if if someone is a you know, is kind of mission of, re of research or needs to do this, finds they want wanting to engage more with the community, and someone offers them that crowdsourcing or as a potential solution, what should they be looking out for? Um, I think, as I mentioned before, checking who the audience is, what you actually want to achieve in the project. That's pretty important. Um, and working out if that's actually going to be viable because you might find that there is not a big enough audience to do this with or there's a big enough audience and it's the right kind of thing but there's not enough time to do it for instance it takes time um, I think you should be looking for ways in which you're going to be building up a long-term kind of network of contacts um, the thing that I was most involved with in corporate in fact was still doing communications type stuff trying to build up a bit of a community um, it is boring stuff like mailing lists, it's also kind of going out there in person sometimes. It's remembering that if you're doing something online, you don't only promote it online, you do it offline as well. Um, so I think in addition to those kind of considerations of what your goals are and who your audience is, and is this the right tool for what you want to do, sort of starting out with kind of what, what is the change in relationship you want to have with that audience perhaps. Um, what kind of expertise you have around you, you know, is this something that you're, ex you know, able to do, is this something you're going to have to partner with another organisation yeah. to do, um, what's it going to cost, and then really, really look at your costings and make sure they're actually realistic, um, because there will be lots of need to do lots of outreach and that's expensive. Um, I don't think there's any kind of successful crowdsourcing project that's not had a lot of legwork involved in terms yeah. of speaking to people, getting out there, explaining what to be done. Um, I know some projects do some training of volunteers mm -hmm. and that's one of the ways that they motivate them, attract them early and get a different set of types of funding as well. So there's mm -hmm. a project called um, Historic Graves in Ireland and they did a sort of, here's how you use a digital camera, here's how you create metadata, here's how you create a record of what's in this, on this gravestone, which is what they were capturing. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of training got them a certain set of money because they were empowering lots of communities, oh, yeah. so very different source of funding. Um, and also enabled them to build up a really interested, really keen network of people. So they had a real backbone of contributors who could then go on and train other people. And I think thinking about that network of how, how, how are people going to participate? How are they going to get other people to participate? How is this going to grow and be supported? And yeah. what's the structure of that? I think that's um, certainly a thing you should be thinking of. Even at the outset, even if the stuff that you're kind of thinking about doesn't come to pass, you should at least think about it yeah. and ask those questions. Um, I, I do think that fundamental thing though is, is this actually the right approach? That's that's probably the most yeah. important. <laughs> there is a lovely, um, so to do the, um, the report they did for UK UF, there's a whole set of questions that were asked of different crowdsourcing projects about mm. what their goals were, about what their intentions were, about how they plan their activities. And I'd say that's actually quite a good plan to go through, like list of questions to go through yeah. when you're trying to plan an activity and see if this is right or not. Like just being able to answer the questions probably says something about how prepared you are to do it. Um, but yeah, thinking about the kind of exit as well, I think is also quite important. Like how, how are you going to fail gracefully or how are you going to sort of succeed gracefully? Because you can, you can succeed poorly as well. Um, and so checking around, having a look at see what else is out there as well, because it yeah. might be that you're better off 
adding some new data capture to an existing experiment, an existing group of people, um, than you are to try and start something wholly new. It's very hard to build a community up from scratch. Um, it's much easier to tap into existing communities. Um, that's part of the reason stuff like kind of co-design and pilots and stuff make a big difference, but it's also um, it's also the case that you've got a whole bunch of people who are really enthusiastic and love doing crowdsourcing yeah. projects, and you can find discussion boards for them, sharing resources and things. So, um, sort of targeting those a little bit, or finding out who the kind of opinion makers are in those communities, and if they think this is a good idea, that yeah. can be really helpful. Um, that's a contact I made on the project that went. Not as well, not badly, but not as well, I mentioned earlier. <laughs> um, that contact has been continuously a really, really good contact on, on the kind of area we were working on there, which was around sort of family history and local history and genealogy. And although that project hasn't gone quite how I want it to be, the kind of contact and network made during it has been really useful for lots of other things. Um, and the feedback from the kind of people we met in the communities there made all the difference anyway, yeah. in terms of our understanding of what we'd done well and what we'd done less well. Um, so I think the, the people are really quite important. If you're talking about something that needs to be um, superly science rigorous kind of stuff, then I also think kind of considering what is going to be acceptable to your researchers mm -hmm. is really important. And we had some really interesting conversations about that in Cobweb, sort of saying, well, what is going to be useful data? Um, and what do we do to make sure that the data you have is useful in the way that you need it to be? And that's part of the reason why kind of having an indication of what the quality is, is important for that project, you know, rather than saying this is trusted or this is not trusted, it's much more, this is trusted to this degree, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but again, if you're then trying to work out which system to work with or what you're going to build yourself, having an idea of what's needed at the other end, what you want to do mm. with that, with that output, um, that's going to make a big difference to how you design those things or who you commission to build it or who you work with yeah. to deliver it. Um, so yeah, I think, I think take advantage of the resources that are already out there as a starting point and ask yourself lots of difficult questions because someone else will if you don't, you know, and probably rather later in the project. Um, I mean, I'd also have to think about who you want to fund it because they will have different priorities. So, you know, the EU will probably want it to be about empowering citizens in general and that's certainly what the last kind of few calls have been about. Um, your research councils may well want it to be about doing data at scale. That's been a real focus for them the last few years, I would say. Um, if you're looking at sort of international funders, they might have a whole different set of kind of a mixture of those kinds of criteria. Um, in some cases, funders will want stuff to be super openly available. That might be another kind of reason to do it in a different type of way. Mm -hmm. So I'd certainly also look at that, sort of thinking quite practically about what, what can I do and who's going to pay for it and how long is it going to run for, what yeah. scale can it work at. Um, yeah. It's been very interesting. Thank you very much indeed. Pleasure. Thank very, you. Right. <laughs> Thanks. So.